Read Talk is supported by Read Design. With the power of machine learning, Read Design derives patterns and trends that accurately predict the characteristics of finished reads. Founded by Logan Asterling, Read Design makes quality reads with characteristics you can count on. Save valuable time and get back to what you love, making music. Visit readesign.io to learn more. And also by Ugly Duckling Oboes helps every student succeed, offering both in-person and online lessons. An authorized dealer of Fox, Fasadi, and Buffet instruments, we offer sales and rental of new and used oboes. We sell reeds and oboe cane for all levels of oboists. Let Ugly Duckling Music be a part of your student's success story. Like us on Facebook or go to UglyDucklingOboes.com. Welcome to Read Talk. I'm Margaret Marco. And I'm Courtney Miller. Our guest today is Phil Ross, the Associate Principal Oboist of the St. Louis Symphony. Welcome, Phil. Hello. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Oh, I'm so excited. Well, let's get started with a little bit about your background. You had a somewhat unique entree into the world of oboe playing. So mm -hmm. could you start by telling us a little bit about your background and your training? Well, sure. So I started actually on the violin when uh -huh. I was four years old. And I did Suzuki violin for 14 years up until I graduated high school. I added piano and I learned how to, you know, read music and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, seventh grade rolled around and the band program started. And, you know, there's no string program in, in my school growing up. So everybody in my family did band. Now my older brother already picked the trombone. So I was kind of like, eh, I guess I can't pick the trombone. But, <laughs> you know, being the son of an oboist, a really good oboist, I was like, well, I'll, I'll try the oboe. Why not? And I loved it. To me, it just it just clicked and made a lot of sense. And I, I just loved putting it together and just playing and playing. And, you know, of course, dad gave me good reads. And, you know, that made it a lot <laughs> easier. I would just say, hey, dad, you know, I, I need, need a, a read. read. <laughs> I need a read. And he would give me stuff and it was fine. And I remember one time we, we both drove down to, to Little Rock because I was in the youth orchestra and he had a rehearsal with the Arkansas Symphony. And we we pull up and he realized he'd forgotten his read case. And I was like, uh oh, what are you gonna do? He's like, you know, don't don't play with me. Just give me a read. I need a read. I'm like, oh, okay, you know. So <laughs> I let him pick from his own reads which one he wanted. And you know, that was it was fine. But, oh, uh, that's yeah. a great story. I love that. Fantastic. <laughs> no, he was he you know, he was very generous with with the reads and the time and and uh it was wonderful being his kid growing up for a ton of reasons, obviously, but you know, always having the read hookup was just a small part of it. Oh, yeah. Dan was a <laughs> wonderful man. I just felt the world of him. So your father was Dan Ross. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a wonderful oboist, person, musician, and just beloved around this country. So what was it like growing up with a father who was a professional oboist and being surrounded by famous oboists growing up? Was there like a star factor for you? Yeah, sort of. I mean... There was always somebody coming through, and I never knew who they were because, you know, when you're growing up, when I was growing up, you know, we didn't have the internet back then when I was learning to play the oboe, and you didn't put a, a face with the sound of the oboe. You know, we would always listen to orchestras and, oh, who, what orchestra is this playing, you know, and yeah. play that game back when we could kind of tell, oh, there's Cleveland and Mac, and there's, you know, Philadelphia, whether it was uh, Delancey or Woodhams or, you know, just... You know, you could listen to an orchestra and tell who was what the orchestra was from the oboe player. But they would be in his office and I wouldn't know who they were. There's just some other oboe player as far as I'm concerned. And, <laughs> you know, so, I, yeah, I got to meet my fair share. And at the time, I, I was too young to really, really kind of understand and get it, you know. And, and by the time I was about to go off to college, I could say, oh, well, I can I can definitely take advantage of some of the you know, the players that would come through and spend some time and maybe look at their reads or just kind of ask a question here and there. I try not my best not to get in the way, but they, they were always generous with their time. Like I remember Ernie Harrison would, he pulled me aside and, and he made some tapes from, you know, Tommy toe lessons for me and, you know, gave them to me. I thought that was so sweet of him. And few people would give me lessons here and there. And it was, oh, it was just, it was just really wonderful, you know? And wow, that must've been really 
fascinating how lucky yeah. you were <laughs> to see yeah. all those people <laughs> yeah. and hear them play and see them in a more casual setting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes when they would do like a recital while they were there and we would get to go to that. And it was nice. it was wonderful growing up. Can you share with us your other reed making mentors and influences? Well, sure. I, uh, you know, dad was so good with keeping everything simple, you know, so he didn't, he didn't like to get too technical about anything read wise. Uh, then I went up to college at Eastman and, you know, Mr. Kilmer was a lot the same way. Just to try to keep it as easy as possible. You know, here's your tip. Here's your back. Here's your heart. You know, he mm-hmm. likes to make fast reads. I like to make fast reads. I'm down with that. Uh, then in grad school, I studied with Alex Klein and he had, you know, he delved a lot deeper into, you know, the specifics of the read. And um, let's see, there was a year here after Peter Bowman retired, we had a year where we basically had like a, a different guest principal almost every week. And so that revolving door, being a second oboist was really hard to try to, you know, like mm-hmm. switch gears every single week. And, and but um Occasionally, I'd have somebody over to the house, and we'd sit down and make reads. And I think the my favorite was Kathy Greenbank came. Oh my god, one of my heroes, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah, uh, just gorgeous. I just love listening to her play. But she came, and she sat down, and she made reads with with me and my wife. And and I just looked at her like, what in the world? I'd never seen anything like this before. She yeah. had such a different take on the on basically how to use your knife. You know, she really used it as as a tool. And, you know, as we all know, there's a right way and a wrong way to use a tool. Mm-hmm. And she would scrape on the tip almost sideways, you know, instead of like going up with the, the reed, she would go across the grain. And I thought, oh, my God, I've never seen anybody scrape like that. And she had these really fast, very controlled scrapes. And I was like, wow, that's amazing to me. And so she kind of walked me through, you know, why she did all that and, and her thoughts on it. And boy, it really, really improved my remaking. So I've got wow. a lot of lot of thanks to give to her still for that. It is interesting how knife technique can affect the sound of a read. I mean, yes. I'm, I'm oh, a firm yeah. believer in, in, in that. Not just, you know, um, accuracy of your scrape or measurements, but actually, like you were talking about with Kathy, how she scraped across the grain. That must have had something to do with her beautiful sound. I think so. You know, you got to have a really sharp knife and you can't use any pressure yeah. doing that. But right. um, just, you know, and her idea being if the knife is touching the end of your tip at all times, you know that that's going to be the thinnest part. And that was my dad's like one and only rule. He said, you know, just make sure the end of the tip is the thinnest part. That's mm-hmm. the one rule of remaking. Yeah. And then, you know, his tricks were, which I I follow today. You know, if, if your B to C interval is really wide, clip your read. Usually, once you get up to a C, it takes care of that. If you can, uh, if you play a top line F sharp and you blow it, you know, to the point where it's like kind of wonky there, there's, you know, take more out of the back. And, you know, really kind of simple approaches like that to read making. And, and that's, that's really what I try to do. You know, you, obviously the gou- gouge, you got to get good. But after that, it's smooth sailing. <laughs> right. It's smooth yes. sailing, you know. Yes, well, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about gouging machines, if you don't mind. <laughs> a little bit. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Let's, get deep. Let's do this. So your your dad, Dan Ross, developed this amazing gouging machine that uh, was, was wildly popular throughout North America. And lots of principal oboists throughout this country and uh, Canada use that gouging machine. I'm the proud owner of two of them myself, and I think they're just wonderful. And then you developed your own gouging machine. So I wonder if you could talk to us first about your general philosophy of how the gouging machine affects reed making and what, if any, improvements did you make to your father's gouging machine? Or is your gouging machine just, did it just go off in a totally different direction? Oh, no, no. I, I still make the machine. I follow the recipe. It's, okay. <laughs> you know, to the, to the T. That's, you know, I, I believe in the machine. He had some influences on, on the machine itself and uh, the machine he settled on that has not changed since 1993. Wow! And uh, yeah, it just it just works. Now the blades have evolved over that time, and they've gotten much better. So now the only difference between what I do and what he did was he started off 
grinding the blades at a pretty steep angle. And over the years, he would make a different kind of a jig to hold the blade that would grind it a little closer and closer to 45 degrees. He eventually got to, I think it was like 42 degrees. He used that for, for a long, long, long time. And, uh, you know, he and, and Kilmer worked over the years to, to kind of fig- figure out the blade. And my dad says, oh, I'd like to one day experiment with another angle. So I kind of sat down and I drew up a, a plan for a holder that you can adjust the angle. And he looked at it and he, you know, okay, well, there's, there's something there. I can, I can play around with this. So he, he changed the plans and made it even more simple because, you know, that's, that's the best. In his mind, as, as dumbed down as he could make it, then that's, to him, easier to get accuracy for. And when you're talking gadget machine, that's what you got. You got to have accuracy. Yeah. And so he made this holder and he just gave it to me. He says, well, I don't have time to play with this, but you do. Go home and, you know, experiment with this thing and figure out what's going on. So my angle is just a little bit different than his. And, but... You know, by the by the time we had both kind of settled on our ideal gouge, we would we would trade blades with each other and look at them. And man, if you held them up together, you couldn't tell a difference. They're just so close. You could still get the same center to side measurements, and maybe just something in between there is a little bit different, like microns different. You know, but um, yeah, it's just it's very subtle, very very subtle. Well, I always wondered if that's what it comes down to, why people choose one gouger over the other. Is it the subtle differences between the center and the side? Because we all go for similar measurements. We all want 58 to 60 in the center Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 48 on the side. So what's going on there between the center and the sides that changes from from gouger to gouger? Well, that's a great question. I... I'm not super familiar with a lot of the other machines, as you could imagine. I, you know, you're pretty focused on. <laughs> I'm pretty focused on the one, but I mean, right. I have worked on some other ones. I think what is different about this one is, you know, the size of the bed and the size of the guide. It's not a metric size; it's a standard size. Uh, first of all, and I asked Dad, "Well, why didn't you make it metric?" And he said, "Well, the back back in the day when he was making them." metric tools were a lot more expensive. So oh. he said, well, I just got the closest thing and ran with it. And you know, it works great. Uh, the philosophy on this machine is the bed doesn't move. Mm-hmm. And you don't mess with the guide. You don't file the guide or sand it or down or anything. So the reason being, you to line up the bed, you, you just take the blade out, lower the carriage into the bed, and voila, you want to make sure it's lined up perfectly. And then you put the blade in and it, and it just works. You know, mm-hmm. if there's other machines out there that you, you move the bed or you, you know, the, of course, there's this whole single versus double radius kind of right. conversation, which, mm-hmm. you know, in secret, every machine like this is a double radius, but yeah. shh, don't tell anybody. Okay. Okay. We won't tell anyone. <laughs> you can say for those. <laughs> well, when it comes down to it, it's, ju- it's just, you know, unless you actually gouge the cane and turn it around and nothing comes off when you pass, then, mm-hmm. you know. That would be a, a true single radius. Uh, so I have a couple of questions about y- using the Ross. I was wondering, because of the, the single radius or double radius, uh, do you advocate for flipping the cane every few few swipes? I don't, no. I think that if you flip every few swipes, you're you're actually putting a little bit more stress on one part of the blade. And so the people who say, oh, I want to flip, I want to flip it so I spare the blades. Well, you're actually wearing out one spot of the blade a lot faster than the rest of it. So I would go all the way down and flip it at the end. And also, you know, as you're gouging, if, if the cane starts to move to one side or the other and you can't blame it on the, just the cane being kind of wonky, you might say, oh, something might be up with where the blade is or what the bed is, something like that. Yeah, so I, I say go all the way down flip it around, see what comes off. And that's that's very telling. Well, one more uh, utilitarian question. How can you tell when it's time to uh, replace the blade or sharpen the blade on the Ross machine? Is it, is it just a cutting action? Or what are some tips you have for our listeners about this? Right. So I would say if you're gouging and the curls that come off are yeah, starting to kind of like look like Swiss cheese or they're really, really fuzzy. Yeah, maybe that's a sign, but also maybe that means there's not enough blade exposed. It's a, it's it's a little 
you've got to measure it to see how thick they are. Now, in your reeds, you're just going to kind of notice slowly, well, my reeds don't really want to be up to pitch anymore, or I'm kind of having a hard time getting some... Uh, get